The views and opinions expressed on Reasonably Speaking are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of the American Law Institute or the speakers' organizations. The content presented in this broadcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered legal advice. Please be advised that episodes of Reasonably Speaking explore complex and often sensitive legal topics and may contain mature content. Welcome to Reasonably Speaking. I'm thrilled to welcome criminal law professor Aaron Murphy and torts professor Ken Simons, experts in their respective fields who are perfectly positioned to discuss today's topic, consent in criminal and civil law. Aaron Murphy is a professor at NYU Law. She's an expert on criminal law and procedure, evidence, and professional responsibility in the criminal context. She's widely published and highly respected for her work, particularly in forensic DNA typing, and has been cited multiple times by the U.S. Supreme Court. Prior to becoming a law professor, she spent five years as an attorney with the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia. Ken Simons, Chancellor's Professor of Law at University of California, Irvine Law, is a leading scholar of tort law, criminal law, and law and philosophy. He has published influential scholarship concerning assumption of risk and contributory negligence, the nature and role of mental states in criminal, tort, and constitutional law, and negligence as a moral and legal concept. Ken and Aaron, thank you so much for joining us here today. We're happy to be here. So today we're going to talk about consent, but we're going to do it by looking at two distinct areas of law, civil and criminal. And to start, before we get into consent, Ken, can you just tell me a little bit of background for the audience who may not realize that there is a difference between tort law and criminal law? Sure. Um, Though criminal law involves the state prosecuting a case, having to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, and the purposes are usually uh, punishment and deterrence, tort law is concerned with giving damages to the victim of wrongdoing. And a lot of torts are crimes, and a lot of crimes are torts, but they're not exactly equivalent. For example, if a drunk driver runs over a victim, that victim might ask the prosecutor to bring charges, and the prosecutor might decide to do so against the drunk driver. The victim also has a chance to potentially sue in tort if the driver has insurance or assets to make it worthwhile. But if a drunk driver doesn't run anybody over, no tort claim can be brought. However, it can be a criminal case because that's still very dangerous conduct, and the criminal law has an interest in that. I think that is where. Criminal law has drawn most of its authority is this idea of moral condemnation. It's a, it has a sort of special ability to single people out, either to signal to a community that behavior is unacceptable or to, you know, incapacitate individuals who might pose a danger to the community and to protect the community. Whereas court really is more about individuals who are private, you know, in their being compensated or so forth. I think in both fields, I don't know if you would agree, Ken, but the, from my perspective, in both fields, there's become this more and more, there's become more and more of a desire on the part of individual claimants in court to bleed that line a little bit more. And so you see people in criminal cases who want compensation and victim compensation funds develop. And, you know, they're asking for what are essentially tort remedies, damages or assistance with their medical expenses or other uh, injuries to their property. And you also see, I think, areas of tort law that we might have thought as sort of uniquely tort becoming more and more criminalized. And so things, whether it's a kind of corporate crime field where we might have thought, you know, the way for a company to deal with a bad product or something would be to compensate people. Now there's more of a desire to see criminal penalties attached or the stigma of a criminal conviction attached to bad actors. Um, So the line is blurring, I think, in, in, in people's desires to see the system a certain way. I would agree with what Aaron said. The one thing I might emphasize, though, uh, which is consistent with what she said, is in tort law, there isn't the same need to assure that the defendant was seriously culpable or a serious wrongdoer. Their simple, ordinary negligence is sufficient for tort liability. If a surgeon makes a small mistake during the course of an operation, ends up causing harm to a patient, that could result in a huge tort a malpractice judgment, but it's extremely unlikely it will result in a criminal punishment unless the person's a repeat offender or has acted with gross negligence. And I think we may see that when we talk about the issue of consent. I think it plays out somewhat differently in tort and criminal law, in part because of the need for a higher level of culpability in criminal law. Mm-hmm. 
So consent is the reason we're here. What we hear in the news usually is around sex, right? Sex between two adults, was there or wasn't there consent? But it's a much larger word than just that. So can we explore consent more generally first within the law? What does consent I don't think there is a mean? uniform definition of consent in the law. I mean, shockingly, there's not even a uniform definition of consent in sexual offenses. So, you know, we'd, we'd have to get that low-hanging fruit before we climb the tree. You know, you do see the idea of consent percolate in a lot of different areas of law. There's obviously consent defenses that arise in a whole range of non-sexual crimes. So it's possible to consent to an assault. That's the sport of boxing (laughs) or, you know, other possibly offensive touchings that way. You know, medical treatments often require consent or even heightened levels of consent in the ethical standards and so forth of informed consent. You see consent in how businesses are created, you know, a partnership to form a partnership. The parties, in a sense, consent to become partners. That's just rattling off some examples, but there there are innumerable ways in which behavior becomes either legally cognizable because of consent or becomes uh, legally permissible because consent takes away what would have been a criminal offense or a tort. And uh, one other example would be contract law. In contract law, it's important that the parties reach an agreement on the commercial terms or the other terms of some interaction. And we tend to focus very heavily there on the external manifestation of the agreement, what words they said could reasonably be understood by each other about what they were intending. And there are very good reasons uh, for doing that in contract law. My view of tort law is that that is not always necessary, that uh, a subjective willingness to permit something to occur may count as consent. There's a, there's a doctrine within tort law called assumption of risk that essentially is another kind of consent doctrine involving the defendant acting negligently. And some jurisdictions will preclude a plaintiff from recovering because the plaintiff is well aware of the risks and obtains some benefit out of taking the risks. Uh, and that's not a question of their having necessarily to communicate that to the injurer. The injurer may have already created the dangerous condition. The plaintiff then just decides whether to, to confront it or not. So I think it makes some sense to use a somewhat different conception of consent in different domains. You know, that just raises another distinction with criminal law and tort law. Because criminal law is really focused on societal judgments and moral condemnation, it's less preoccupied with things like contributory negligence or assumption of risk. You know, if you're in a framework of tort and you're trying to resolve, you know, how much did one person harm another and what who bears the responsibility for that harm? You would engage these doctrines. Did you know what you're getting into? Did something you do contribute to it that's going to offset your recovery or maybe preclude recovery? Whereas in criminal law, we don't ask those questions typically. And I will say sex is one area where it gets murky. But, you know, we we typically don't say, oh, well, it's not a burglary because you left your house unlocked or you put your big TV right in the window where everyone could see it. You assumed a risk it would be stolen. Or we don't even say, uh, you know, you decided to date someone with a record of conviction for homicide. So when you were killed, you assumed the risk and, you know, so be it. The resistance of law, of criminal law to any kind of contributory negligence or assumption of risk doctrine is longstanding. And it's a source of frustration sometimes in cases where it feels like the culpability of the actor might be offset by some of the carelessness or the the poor judgment of the victim or the other person. But, um, But generally speaking, we have not had that frame in criminal law. You're responsible for your misdeeds, regardless of whether somebody else um, also contributed to it. So I would agree, Aaron, with some of what you said, but not all of what you said. (laughs) So I would completely agree with you with respect to carelessness of a victim. Mm -hmm. If a pedestrian is looking at their smartphone when they're walking across (laughs) the street and the driver is looking at their smartphone while they're driving into the pedestrian, In tort law, both parties' fault will be taken into account, and the plaintiff might only receive a partial recovery. Whereas in criminal law, the driver might be prosecuted, and whether there was a careless pedestrian or victim really doesn't matter at all. However, I do think criminal law does take assumption of risk into account in some contexts. Think about something like a boxing match. If two individuals agree to legally form, a legally permitted form of what would otherwise count as physical assault, uh, 
then not only for tort law purposes, but for criminal law purposes, it's unlikely that the parties will be able to be prosecuted for doing what otherwise would count as unjustifiable kind of uh, injury. So Although I think there are at least be. some contexts where assumption yeah. of risk works as a defense in the criminal Well, law. I wouldn't call that assumption of risk. I'd call it consent. For instance, in the criminal law, you're allowed to consent to an assault, but you're not allowed to consent to assaults that cause serious bodily injury or death, typically. So you can consent to a boxing match, but you can't consent to be killed. And, you know, again, we would prosecute and we see prosecutions in these random little weird cases where, you know, somebody, well, a good example is assisted suicide, uh, which is, you know, a very fraught area for constitutional purposes. But just in the criminal law, you know, it's not a defense for a person who assists someone committing suicide to say they wanted me to help, they needed my help, they asked for my help, they signed a notarized document, you know, seeking my help. Because we preclude consent in that situation and because the party, you know, whether you frame it as assumption of risk, however you frame it, we've made a social judgment that this is not acceptable behavior regardless of what the other person is doing. Now, I will say one way in which some idea might come into play is the criminal law also historically, and again, we've drifted from these historical roots, but has, has very much committed itself to mental states of an actor being a critical part of how we think of liability. So, you know, if you think of the bread and butter of tort law as negligence liability, somebody who acted in an unreasonable way and therefore is responsible for the consequences, that is not the same rule of thumb. In criminal law, in criminal law, we're looking for people who acted with a much higher sense of intentionality in their wrongdoing. And so, well, however, you know, in the model penal code, that's framed as purpose and knowledge, and recklessness. But all three of those mental states have in common that the actor themselves has to be aware of, at minimum, a, a pretty significant or substantial risk they're engaging in this unjustified, reckless behavior. And that's one way maybe to capture some of these ideas that we we only, you know, look to actors who are unjustified and um, engaging in this uh, behavior with an awareness of the harm that they're causing. But, but even still, you know, you can be fully aware that you're causing a homicide, but it's never going to be a defense that they wanted it. Are there some aspects of consent that are universal? I don't know. I actually don't think so. What do you think? I don't know either. Um, I mean, I guess I would say that some that consent is always to some extent connected with the notion of the victim being willing to permit conduct that would otherwise be wrongful. Put it at a very, state at a very high level of generality, I think that is a, a key element of consent. But how it actually plays out in practice is still going to vary quite a bit. So in, in contract law, we don't care what the private beliefs of the victim were about whether they wished something to, to be a contract term or not. We only care about their external manifestation. In both criminal law and tort, it's somewhat controversial whether we care mainly about the external manifestation or mainly about the state of mind of the individual. And if we're looking at the state of mind, what kind of state of mind do we care about? Is it an affirmative desire for the conduct that, that took place or is it enough that there was merely willingness? My sense, and certainly in tort law, is that willingness is, is more than enough. Uh, if you reluctantly in, uh, invite someone to your dinner party, hoping that they don't come, and they do end up arriving, and they're just as boring as you expected them to be, uh, that still counts as consent to what would otherwise would be a trespass. So it doesn't require affirmative desire or uh, enthusiastic uh, attitude towards the conduct for it to count as consent. Uh, and I think that's true in quite a few contexts, though I hesitate to say in all. You know, it's funny because I would frame that differently because in the, the example you described, I would say that person wasn't subjectively willing. Or you might say they were equivocating about their will, their subjective willingness, but their objective indicia in, was willingness, which is to say they invited the person over and welcomed them. And I know in our debates, when we think of subjective willingness, we're really asking what is the internal sentiment of the person. So I can say... I'd love to have more of your stew, Grandma. And inside, I'm dying. I've always hated Grandma's stew. But my external indicia is willingness to have stew, even if my internal subjective state is detesting and loathing the stew. And, and we could ask then, did I consent to the stew? And one answer could be, no, you didn't, because your internal state of unwillingness is what matters. What matters is what's in your heart of heart. 
And another answer could be, yeah, because when you say the words, you do it whether or not you, you consented, whether or not you, you know, your internal state reflected accurately the words you spoke. And that, I think, has been an ongoing area of conflict and contrast in the criminal law and especially in sexual offenses because of two things. One is that there's a sense of injustice if a person's internal state is willing and their external indicia is unwilling, you know, in a sexual context and especially. If we have a factual scenario in which someone is in their heart of heart saying, I'm disgusted by this person. I hate them. I don't want to have you know sexual relationships with them. But in the external manifestation, they're saying, you're so handsome, please come over and taking off their clothes and smiling and engaging. It seems unjust to say, oh, we're going to credit the internal feeling over the external expression. You, you can kind of reasonably rely on the external expression. Conversely, if it can be hard to say, you know, if the internal feeling is, I definitely want this, I definitely want this, but the external behavior is, you know, quote unquote, hard to get or, you know, suggesting, no, I shouldn't, no, I don't want to, no, I'm not interested, no, don't. It feels unjust to convict someone potentially if we can access that internal state and know that they were in fact willing, they were just putting up a fake facade. And I think the evolution of the criminal law on this issue has been tricky because historically, there's been the conception that no doesn't really mean no, and the legal standards for consent required high levels of physical resistance to qualify as a no. The law's idea in the sexual context was that people, you know, good girls are going to say no when they're approached for sex. And so you should accept only kicking and biting and scratching and screaming. That's how you know someone really doesn't want to have sex. If they're just saying no, it's just because they're putting up one of these fake facades, and they definitely would still mean yes, unless they take it to the next level. And then, you know, we had this movement to get a little bit more willing to accept a verbal no as enough. So now the presumption could be like, well, we assume somebody is willing unless they say no, at least, or kick and scream, punch, whatever. But we're, we're moving now, I guess I'm jumping ahead a little bit, we're moving now to a standard where the, the question is the same kind of question we ask in other types of offenses, which is, you know, in assaults and burglaries and robberies and so forth, we don't say, you know, did you say don't take my property before they took your property? Did you have a no trespassing sign on your house? Did, did you say no before the act occurred? Because otherwise we assume, you know, you wanted it. Now we've started to reframe to say, wait, isn't the right inquiry? Is this something that somebody was willing to do? And willingness then becomes the question rather than unwillingness. And I think that's a pretty fundamental shift. And once we get to willingness, we have to ask the harder questions of subjective or objective. Does it matter what you feel in your heart versus what you put in the world and how to think about that? But um, I think just that one shift is pretty monumental because the entire history of sexual assault law is one in which the, the kind of cornerstone question was, um, was this person expressing a very narrow idea of unwillingness. And that was the only legal cognizable kind of defense, as it were, for the victim. And, you know, that now I think we've moved away from. I agree that the movement that Aaron described is, is exactly what's happened in criminal law. And I believe it's an influence tort law as well. It's pretty clear in tort law that any expression of unwillingness, whether verbal or physical, will be sufficient for courts to say that this does not count as consensual. And uh, that, in fact, what we are proposing in the most recent draft of the intentional torts restatement, that that should be made explicit in the black letter of the restatement so that given that this is an area that's likely to be litigated more and more, we should make it absolutely clear what the tort law standards are. And I also agree that things get a little more complicated when you deal with situations of ambiguity where the person who has not initiated the sexual contact sends signals that may not be quite as clear with respect to willingness or unwillingness, and whether there should be a presumption that there is no consent unless it's affirmatively expressed is actually an, a somewhat open question in tort law. There are very few cases, uh, in fact, no cases that we've been able to find directly on point on that issue. It's an area of the law that I expect will continue to evolve. Uh, I'll just add one more thing, which is I don't think the tort and criminal law standards in this area have to be identical. There are some very good reasons in the criminal law to be cautious before criminalizing conduct that uh, is, is not at this point clearly against current social norms. 
uh, or where the social norms are in flux, but they don't clearly prohibit the behavior as, as impermissible or as, or, or as highly culpable. Tort law is, does not perform the same function. It, it's focused on whether there's a, a relationship between the parties in which one has acted improperly, impermissibly, but not necessarily with a very high level of culpability. Do you agree? I think there's a couple things that, yeah, I think I do, I do agree. Um, maybe I'll just add a couple of glosses. So one would be, you know, I think the special power of the state to incarcerate, to morally condemn is one we should not lose track of when we're writing penal law. And I think that's underpinning what Ken's saying, you know, that this awesome power of the state to deprive someone of liberty and to sort of stigmatize them for life with a conviction to impose collateral consequences like registration, stripping voting rights or access to certain benefits. We in a society that has become very familiar with incarceration and criminal law as a path to effectuating all kinds of social goals, I think can lose track of how narrow ideally the penal law should be. So I, I definitely agree with that. And I think it's particularly important to think of um, again, the role that the mental state of the defendant plays here in, in that precursor decision to effectuate some kind of conviction or, or uh, arrest or whatever. So requiring that someone be acting with a certain mental state, I think, is, is an essential component of that. Where, you know, I might add a few glosses is two things. One, is I think, as a matter of practicality, and I don't think this is a reason to change how we think of the penal law, but it's important to remember and contextualize a lot of the kinds of offenses that we're talking about will be unlikely to see much action in a civil court of law. And that's for various reasons. I mean, the most obvious is that you're not entitled to an attorney if you have a civil cause of action or a tort, which means you have to find a lawyer who's willing to take it. Many people don't have the money. Litigation is lengthy. Civil litigation is very expensive and costly for many cases of this kind. The kind of damages you could get from a sexual assault, I think, are a little in flux. You know, maybe you could get something simple like the hospital expenses paid for, or maybe even some therapy expenses paid for. But those are going to be pretty trivial as compared to the real costs you think of a sexual assault, which might be something about your emotional opportunities or, you know, your, your sense of well-being. And there isn't really a great way to quantify those things. So a lawyer is not likely to take on what's, what's, what's apt to be an expensive and time-consuming litigation for what is really peanuts. Uh, the one thing I might add yeah. is that th there will be a subcategory of cases where either the defendant is wealthy or the defendant has, uh, or has insurance and has repeatedly engaged in this type of sure. conduct where uh, even though there may not be physical harm, the offensiveness of the conduct is, is very clear and there's a possibility of punitive damages. And th that does then give a greater incentive for a lawyer to, to take the case. I mean, a Cosby type situation Correct. would be a type of that, I think. Or even some, you know, we've seen high profile claims against entertainers and athletes, something where you think you've got a deep pocket and maybe there's a pattern. And so you can um, hopefully get some punitive damages, which are these kind of money damages that are meant to be punishment, not just compensating. So that's one thing to consider is that the tort remedy, you know, is different in kind. Also that in a sexual assault case, many victims, I think, are seeking, they're seeking something specific, which is they are seeking the moral condemnation. They're seeking a judgment that this was wrong and not acceptable behavior. And so the special, again, authority of the law here kind of has, it, it does kind of require weighing both sides, which is to say, on the one hand, making sure that you're respecting that power when it comes to incarcerating people in a society, but also making sure that the state and the message the state sends about what's acceptable and unacceptable behavior is a clear one and is one that reflects the values of the state. There's, you know, when I teach criminal law, there are all kinds of areas that I bring up where I, I point out the what we call the expressive power of law or the power of law to change norms, to change what people think. You know, when I I'm middle-aged, shall we say. And uh, you know, when I was coming of age, you know, in the very young, my youth, drunk driving was not really a big thing. People did it all the time. It wasn't considered, you know, morally objectionable. You weren't a deviant if you would, you know, drive drunk. And, um, you know, accidents happened, but the tort system could maybe compensate for, uh, you know, injuries and so forth. And it wasn't considered a, a big deal. And then Organizations like the Mothers Against Drunk Driving came along and they said this is something that deserves our moral condemnation as a society and we should treat it you know, seriously and we should condemn it even when no accidents happen. We should condemn this as a deviant behavior to get in a car when you've passed some limit of uh, intoxication is something that deserves the judgment of the state. And 
I think now, you know, and I talk to my students and we talk about crimes like drunk driving. I've had students rate drunk driving as equivalent to uh, aggravated assault, meaning beating someone within an inch of their life. Not drunk driving that causes an accident. Just the, the act of getting in your car while intoxicated is a morally deviant act at the same level in some of their eyes to physically beating someone almost to death. That tells you a lot about the power of law to condemn, the power of law to change a society's understandings of right and wrong. And, you know, the Mothers Against Drunk Drivers would say of the power of law to pr protect its citizens, because as a result of these laws, the fatalities and injuries from uh, drunk drivers has plummeted. And this, we can say as a society, is a win for, you know, protecting people who, who would have otherwise been harmed. And so... I think it's a constant struggle and an important burden of the criminal law to carry, that dual responsibility to be um, expressing the values of the society and to ensuring you're expressing and protecting all of the society, not just the people in power, not just in the sexual assault context, not just the male idea of what sex looks like uh, in a kind of very crude way. But, you know, to make sure that all of the members of a society can feel safe and protected in that society and can share a common set of norms about behavior. You know, as we become bigger and more heterogeneous as a society, this is an increasingly challenging problem. But I think it's one we have to struggle with continuously. I, mean, I agree the aggressive power of the criminal law is very important uh, and it's one, one of its most important functions. Though at the same time, I would say in, in some of these areas, for example, affirmative consent, there are other social institutions that can play a very important expressive role. And if we think about how students are educated in middle school and high school and college about appropriate sexual behavior and how student disciplinary codes have changed so that affirmative consent it seems to be very much the evolving norm, I think that is uh, itself going to change social norms over the next uh, 10 or 20 years, even if the criminal law does not actually endorse affirmative consent. And then maybe a generation from now, the criminal law will take that position because it will be much more clearly established that that's the kind of behavior that's uh, unacceptable. If there's no prior relationship, you know, the, for example, if a stranger walks up to someone on the bus or the subway and touches their genitals, uh, clearly affirmative consent is the standard that should apply. We shouldn't apply some vague contextual consent standard, we should say, no one would reasonably expect that there was consent in that circumstance, and social norms are clearly against that. But on the other hand, if, if people have been dating for a while uh, and they've held hands and one of them spontaneously kisses the other for the first time, uh, a strict application of the affirmative consent standard would say there wasn't uh, actual consent to the kiss. And I'm not really sure we're at the point now or maybe in, even in the near future where a request for a slightly more intimate form of sexual contact should always be required. Yeah, I mean, I certainly agree with that. I would, I would say a couple of points. One is um, I agree that there are institutions, colleges especially, have been shifting toward a more affirmative consent model. I think, you know, two observations on that. One is... Um, you know, I do wonder exactly how much sexual education around consent occurs in the elementary and middle and high school. I think most of it's unfortunately not happening until college and if at all in college. The second is, you know, even if colleges are really out ahead, I think, and this, you know, reinforces your point, but only 50% of the people in this country go to college. And so that's a huge percentage of people. And in fact, when you read criminal cases, I would hazard the guess that the, the share of those who did not go to college are much more heavily represented in actual criminal fact patterns than those who go to college. And so I think you raise a really interesting and important point about where the norm transmission occurs, you know, who is going to um, shift people's subjective understandings about what's appropriate and not appropriate in sexual behaviors. I will say in current law, I think we're at about 36 states have a form of a, an affirmative consent model for penal liability. It really ranges the spectrum in terms of how severe the punishment is and so forth. And it's not really universally defined. Since we're, since we're here, I, I want to make two important points along this line, especially picking up Ken's thought on context. So no jurisdiction that I'm aware of, and certainly the ones I'm thinking are in the penal law, so maybe torts is different, but imposes an affirmative consent standard that requires verbal consent. So even colleges, I think there's one campus, literally like one college, not even a system, that expects verbal consent, which is to say literally the words, yes, kiss me, or yes, touch me, or whatever. All the affirmative consent standards in college and in penal law are 
ones that also allow behaviors to count. So actions like taking off someone's clothes, taking off your own clothes, those are all going to be cognizable under an affirmative consent standard. Now, there's a lot of room for gray in behavior that I think we can't gloss over. Um, behavior also has been, you know, there are members of the victim advocacy community who will say, well, when a person, they're usually thinking of a woman, but when a, a, a person's confronted with um, unwanted sexual advances, sometimes they can freeze up. Sometimes they can engage in what seem like conciliatory behaviors, like taking off their clothes. You know, it's this kind of crude, but when you read the cases, there's like almost a subgenre of cases that I call the tilted pelvis cases because there's a lot of ambiguity in the facts. But one fact that people stumble on is that woman will lift her pelvis and she'll testify that it's because it makes the intercourse less painful, it makes unwanted intercourse less painful or uncomfortable. And, you know, the defendant will testify or the, the, the defense will claim, well, that's a sign of willingness. And so, you know, if you're lifting your pelvis to facilitate the intercourse, that's it's a behavior in indicating consent. So there's a lot of behavioral cues that can be ambiguous, can be engaged in for reasons other than consent, can be um, consensual and yet mask internal states of unwillingness. Uh, so, you know, I was appeasing the person because I was just scared or what have you. And so trying to make sense of that is tricky. Our standard that we adopted with the ALI is what we've kind of affectionately called contextual consent. And it's trying to get at, I think, a lot of what Ken is speaking to, because what consent looks like in a marriage of 20 years versus a date uh, that you just ended that evening versus on a bus with a stranger can be quite different. And we want to try to have a standard that fundamentally is asking, is a person willing? Because we think that's the right question, not did they express unwillingness, but are they willing? Um, but then the kind of next order question is, how do we judge whether someone's willing? Well, we judge by their behaviors and what they do, but we also have to take into account the context of all the, context of all the circumstances, which would include we've been married for 20 years or would include I've never seen this person before in my life or would include you know, just general facts about the two parties and their the location of the incident, you know, the difference between what consent might look like in your own room, in your own house, you know, in a busy city with your roommate next door versus what consent might look like in the middle of nowhere, all by yourself, where you have no way to get out and there's a weapon present, even if it hasn't been wielded at you. And so that gives, I think, a little bit of that room for a fact finder to say, this was, you know, there were a couple signs of consent or willingness here. Maybe someone took off a shirt or what have you. But there was a lot of contextual circumstances here that, that to me suggest that those ambiguous behaviors did not signal willingness. And, you know, conversely, you could have someone who has a very strong expression of willingness and, you know, in the context of the circumstances that that makes perfect sense as well. So I think that's the advance that we've tried to introduce with co the contextual consent standard is one that's a little less rigid than saying kind of one size fits all and instead is a little bit more able to take into to consideration some of the things that Ken raised. Before we end, I'd like to know, do you think the standard of consent should continue to be treated differently in criminal and civil law? If I could just say something yeah. briefly initially about this, um, I do think there are very good reasons for having higher standards. They're more difficult to to satisfy uh, for for uh, for for liability in criminal law than in tort. In tort law, when we say negligence, we really mean negligence. We mean failure to act as an ordinary person would act. If you go one mile and over one mile per hour over the speed limit and you kill someone. That's uh, a negligence claim that where you can successfully be sued. If a surgeon makes a very predictable uh, and unfortunate kind of mistake in treating a patient and causes harm, then that person can be found liable in tort. In neither one of those cases is it at all likely that they will be criminally liable. And similarly, even though the context here is, is in many respects quite different from those examples, in some ways it's similar. If someone makes a mistake that's not grossly unreasonable, it's just uh, unreasonable. In tort law, that's sufficient. It's sufficient that under contemporary standards, under social norms, what the defendant did is something they should not have done, uh, period, full stop. Whereas in criminal law, if we insist that there be a higher level of culpability, we might want something more like gross negligence or recklessness, 
before we impose uh, liability. And gross negligence would be going 30 miles an hour over the speed limit, or it would be a doctor repeatedly using a method that he's been told was improper to use for this type of surgery, and then that person actually could be criminally punished. So I, I think something similar should be done with respect to even uh, difficult issues such as consent in, uh, with respect to uh, sexual relationships. The model penal code in 1962 took a strong stand against both negligence and strict liability, which is to say no mental state in the criminal law. And, and that maybe it's I'm a product of that code, but... And if I just could interject, yeah. that, and when they said negligence, they actually meant what tort Criminal law would call yeah. gross negligence. Exactly. So not even ordinary negligence exactly. would, would suffice in most cases. Yeah, that's a very important uh, point of clarification because there is something in criminal law called negligence, but it's generally, it's criminal negligence. It's a heightened form of negligence, which in tort would be gross negligence. So that just tells you how much fun it is to be a lawyer. The words don't, <laughs> the words don't mean anything, but, um, or they mean everything, but not what they seem. So in criminal law, the threshold that the model penal code set for any liability is an actor's subjective awareness of at least a substantial and unjustifiable risk. And it's one that I think was the right decision in 1962 and continues to be the right decision today. You know, one thing about mental states is that they're very, we don't usually have direct evidence from people's brains. Um, not everybody, uh, you know, before they do the act writes, I'm going to do this. And so you don't often have direct evidence of someone's mental state, but you can infer someone's mental state from circumstantial evidence or from the behaviors or acts they engage in. And I think it's a, an important safeguard before that condemnation or that conviction and all that it carries comes down that we ensure that an actor is aware of the behavior that they're engaging in that is harmful or that is prohibited. And so um, I think the recklessness floor is the right floor and should remain the floor um, for all penal law, even though we see places where we've drifted away from that, even in, in the criminal codes more generally. If I could just add one thing with yeah, respect to the, the evidence yeah. question, I agree that it's often difficult to know what someone's mental state is. However, given that everyone nowadays seems to carry a smartphone That's with true. them at all <laughs> moments, per, per, perhaps even at intimate <laughs> moments, uh, there are texts that are actually evidence uh, of the mental state of the, the potential victim and also the potential defendant. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if in the decades to That's come, we point. actually get somewhat better evidence of we, mental states than we used to we, have. I think we already <laughs> see that happening. And you know, another thing we see happening is there's a lot more digital evidence generally. I mean, we get video recordings of incidents, whereas in the past they would have been you know, lost to witness recollection. And now you have a little bit more to see objectively the condition of the parties or what have you. So in terms of whether the standards should align, I don't think they should and I don't think they can. I, I think for the reasons we've given already is the kind of primary answer. But, you know, if I think about the standard to enter a contract or the standard to form a partnership, you know, the Uniform Partnership Act at one point we looked up, it says that you form a partnership regardless of your intent to do so. Is if you associate with someone to engage in a for-profit activity, that's a partnership, even if you don't intend to, to be one. And, you know, I think there are a lot of reasons specific to each of the contexts to set that bar higher and lower. There's something, apart from just the questions of the condemnation of state, you know, we have to, I think, be honest with ourselves and appreciate that there's something kind of indescribable but important about the way intimacy unfolds and in its unspoken dimensions and in its um, kind of ambiguities that sometimes the um, great relationship comes from those initial uncertain encounters as much as from enthusiasm from the beginning. And so... I think our laws should say when you as an actor know another person doesn't want to have sex with you or you are aware of a substantial risk this other person doesn't want to have sex with you, you should at minimum pause and clarify. And, you know, if they continue to, to not want to have sex with you, 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 can't, you can't proceed on your own desires in the face of someone else's. Contact offenses, which is to say sexual touches, are so complicated. And, and part of the reason they're so complicated is that you know, exactly what Ken says, it's it's a much less difficult proposition to say before you have the most intimate form of sexual relationship with someone, you have to know that they're willing and you should know that they're willing with, you know, you should, you should, you have a sense that they're willing. It's a lot harder though, because there there is a lot of, you know, stolen kisses that happen and that are desired in our society. Sometimes the first kiss is one where you don't know if the other person is willing, or there's a chance they're not willing and you think they are. And the gray area that can arise in a first kiss situation 
is a much broader range of gray. And we are mindful of that. And we don't want to make it a crime to kiss someone in the hope that you've read them correctly. So our draft doesn't include kisses at all, uh, lip to lip um, or lip to a non-intimate body part. It would include a kiss of an intimate body part um, on that exact premise. And, you know, it, it's a it's a tricky proposition because there are kisses like that that are not wanted. If I'm on a subway and someone walks up to me and kisses me on the lips, that's an offensive touch. And yet our draft means that's not a sex crime. It could be a tort. And one benefit of, of tort law is that's quite broad in this regard. Any physical touching of any sort that's harmful or offensive counts as a battery. Mm -hmm. uh, and any attempted physical touching counts as what tort law calls an assault. They don't worry about whether it's intimate bodily part that's touched or whether it's simply a kiss. Clearly, an unwanted kiss to a stranger still can be offensive and could be the basis of a tort lawsuit. But maybe we need to be a little more cautious in criminal law. Yeah. And, and you know, and again, just to raise it, the obvious, which is that realistically, it's an unlikely suit to take place. The damages of a kiss are going to be minuscule. It would be a purely symbolic uh, verdict, I would imagine. So unless maybe you have this repeat offender issue. So, you know, it's a gap. It leaves a gap. There was an example from a, a, the marathon in Boston, I think, or somewhere. There was a, a popular news story where a woman uh, was running by and uh, I think she, she saw a, a gentleman that was handsome or something. I forget how it happened, but she saw this guy on the sidelines and her, she might have been dared by her daughter by dared her, daughter. her. Yeah, I think her daughter dared her to say, you know, you should kiss that guy or you should whatever. And she, you know, she's running. She's got all the endorphins and she runs over and she grabs him and she kisses him on the lips. And then she keeps running and the news reports it as this, you know, oh, is it a love match? And, you know, because and of course, it turned out the guy was married and his wife was not terribly impressed. And, um, you know, there there I think that's a really nice case to illustrate on the one hand. That, you know, is a story that could have ended in, and that's how they met, and now they're married, and isn't it a wonderful celebration? And on the other hand, though, you know, this man, I mean, this is a place where there had been terrorism. Maybe we, it was a, why is someone grabbing me all of a sudden? And it's a sexual intrusion. Suddenly his kiss, maybe his wife and he are having a rocky relationship, and she thinks he's having an affair, and now he has to explain why this woman he doesn't know kissed him. No, I swear, I don't really, I don't know her, you know? And um, it's, you can see how... From his perspective, it could be a really serious violation of his bodily autonomy, of his personal sexual uh, choices and so forth. And yet you can also see from her perspective how it's just a spontaneous fun moment that could have ended entirely happily for everyone. And so that is some of the conundrum in these, you know, and, and then what is consent in a situation like that? Because it is a, it's an impossible thing to get at. And at an even more basic level, if we had a one size fits all you know, there's a lot of casual sexual touches that happen in longstanding relationships with no indication of willingness. In fact, sometimes they happen when people are, you know, affirmatively not interested, potentially. You know, this is how you're trying to make up with your spouse is to grab them or what have you. And so it's a, it's a tricky, tricky, tricky area because you do want to provide protection and a sense of condemnation for those overstepping acts that you know, we all know happen on streets and public transportation and so forth. But at the same time, even more so is the regard for the preserving that spontaneous and uncertain place where we can engage in intimacy with other people, hoping that it will be welcomed. Thank you both so much. Thank you for tuning in to Reasonably Speaking. Visit ALI.org to learn more about this important topic and our speakers. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Reasonably Speaking is produced by the American Law Institute with audio engineering by Kathleen Morton and digital editing by Kristen Evans. Podcast episodes are moderated by Jennifer Marinigo, and I'm Sean Kellum.